Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 1-6 scale British wall bike. Now the model that we have here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission builds from models ranging from 135th scale all the way up to 1-6 scale. For availability and pricing information, this would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now the model is built mostly out of the box, however I did go ahead and add several modifications as well as improvements to the base starter model. We'll be going over all of these improvements as well as a review of the base starter kit in this video. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle is the Excelsior Well Bike. The Well Bike was a small, light, compact motorcycle or arguably more or less a moped that was specifically designed to be carried onto airplanes and dropped with the British paratroopers. The well bikes were designed in World War II and saw action during the war. The well bike was designed by a British SOE operative who as the story tends to go was a really large motorcycle enthusiast and he went ahead and came up with the basic concept for this unit. After some research and design, the unit was finally approved and went into full production. These units were all manufactured by the Excelsior Motor Company of Birmingham. The well bikes entered into production in 1942 and did not cease production all the way up until the end of the war in 1945. The well bikes utilized a rigid box frame, which had no suspension on it whatsoever, but also utilized a very small engine. The engine was a 98cc two-stroke, single-cylinder, air-cooled gasoline engine. The transmission only had a single speed on it, and the weight came in at around 71 pounds with an empty gas tank. The fuel capacity was a little bit shy of one gallon. Now, like I said before, the unit was fully collapsible. This was important in order for it to fit inside of a CLE canister, which is a standard parachute airdrop container which was utilized by the British during the war. To make the unit collapse, the seat would be able to drop flush to the frame, and the front handlebar and fork mechanism would be able to disengage and collapse in on itself as well, making for it a very tight and small compact package. In order to keep the weight down, the unit's gas tanks were also very, very small. And like I said before, the fuel capacity wasn't exactly all that large. The gas tanks were fed via a gravity-fed system, and the units also had a priming pump system where you would pump air into the gas tanks, giving it pressure for it to feed constant fuel into the carburetor. The fuel pumping system would be done prior to the units being dropped or I should say prior to the units being packaged into the container just prior to the jump. This way the unit is ready to go as fast as possible by the paratroopers who would undoubtedly find it. You would take it out of the container, open up the seat and the fork, start the engine and off you go. The purpose of these units were to give the paratroopers some more mobility and would allow them to transverse or be able to cover a wider area range as opposed to leaving them on foot. Throughout the well bike's production life, several modifications and improvements were made to the units as the contracts kept on progressing. Ultimately, several thousand of the well bikes were produced in total. Now, although the well bike was designed for use with the SOE, the SOE didn't really use them too much, or so it's reported. The majority of the well bike's usage was done with the British paratroopers, specifically with the 6th Airborne Divisions in Arnhem during Operation Market Garden. In addition to the airborne usage, the commandos of the Royal Marines also utilized the well bikes in places like Anzio, as well as in Normandy. Several of them wound up in the Pacific Theater and were stowed away either on transport planes or also in an airbase or two. Now the actual performance of the well bites in combat weren't really mixed. Just like with many of the other amenities for use with airborne troops, the well bike needs to be dropped separately from the infantry. So the 
units are dropped, then the infantry either lands via a parachute or with a glider, and then once on the ground they go scurry around, find their bikes, and take off with them. It sounds good in theory, however in practice, like what was seen on several of the drops either in Normandy or Arnhem, things get scattered very very quickly and easily. Many of the well bikes were found and used and were actually enjoyed by the Germans who either found them first or the units actually landed on them as opposed to the British. And another problem that the well bikes had was that when the operator is riding on the bike he is actually very vulnerable to machine gun fire or just basic small arms fire. Even though the well bike has a few quirks around the edges, the concept of this type of vehicle is still utilized today. If you look at various special forces units, you'll see them utilizing either dirt bikes or other really small type of vehicles which are light, compact, and are needed to be dropped anywhere at any time. After the war, the well bikes were deemed to be obsolete and the entire stock that the British government had were sold off as war surplus. Many of these units wound up in private collections and many of those are still in operational condition today. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this Dragon 1-6 scale British well bike. These kits here date back to 2012, and at that time, Dragon was really heavily invested in the 1-6 scale market. They were releasing figures, but also vehicles at this time. In addition to the vehicles being offered as completed off-the-shelf models, they were they also had the really smart idea on re-releasing many of the models that they sold as pre-built components as unassembled plastic model kits. This, of course, is seen with all of their vehicles, such as the Jeep, the Kitten Crad, and most notably their Panzer II and their M4 A3 Sherman tank. This wall bike here is no different. These models here originally came with the paratrooper that is photographed in the image, and the, again they came as a pre-built, pre-assembled unit that was just an accessory with the figure. Well, Dragon had the really smart idea, like I said before, to just release it as an unassembled kit. By doing this, Dragon keeps their old molds being used, and it cuts down on expense because they don't have to tool up any new components, as well as they don't even have to pay somebody in order to put the thing together and paint it. Now, like I said before, the model was released back in 2012, and I don't believe that this model here has been re-released in recent years like they have done with a few of their other kits, like their Jeep and their Sherman, to name a few. At the time of release, these kits were actually pretty prolific and were found on many online e-tailers such as eBay, Amazon, as well as a few online hobby shops, to name a few. In recent years, however, I would assume that these kits have become a lot more scarcer as, of course, the number on the market has decreased compared to when they were first released. And realistically, these days you're probably going to encounter one of these kits primarily on eBay. Now this kit here was purchased from an online retailer. Unfortunately, I don't recall which one as it has been a number of years that this kit was purchased. It's been sitting in the shop ever since, which you can see from the layer of dust. Also not to mention the box now falling apart after the years of being on the bottom of a pile. So it's gonna be good actually to get this one started and finished. This kit here, along with the other smaller 1-6 scale objects and weapons that were released by Dragon, were also very affordable. This particular kit, I want to say retailed anywhere between 15 and 25 US dollars. However, again, it's hard for me to say for certain because it's been a number of years since this kit was procured. Starting with the model's graphic design, just like with the majority of the other 1-6 scale plastic kits from Dragon, this model here features the minimalistic white background with the figure and the, in this case, the item which the kit represents. Now, like I said before, and what was also seen on the other kits is that the picture is an excerpt from the Dragon catalog where they would showcase this entire figure as a box set. Here we have the British paratrooper along with the well bike, and over here we have a grayed out ghosted image of him riding on the scooter, which is very reminiscent to those funny PTSD memes that are found online. 
memes aside, now it takes us to the graphic design. Just like with the other 1-6 scale kits, Dragon used this yellow type banner. We have 1-6 scale with that weird techno font, and then British Wall Bike with the Dragon logo. On the side here, we have just some features of the model kit, and again, these excerpts are all from the Dragon website that featured this figure when they announced it all those years ago. The graphic design continues along the side. And again, more excerpts of the finished bike. Here we have the Dragon Corporate Info. And again, copyright is 2012. Cracking open the box. Reveals the contents. Now, just like what is also seen on the other Dragon 1-6 scale kits, all of the components are going to be injection molded plastic. Now, in this model here, it, there are going to be a few parts that aren't, which I'll go over once I go over the runners in more detail, but the majority of the kit is comprised of the standard Dragon gray plastic. Also, just like what is seen on their other 1-6 scale kits, the pieces are going to be relatively simplistic and very large in their surface area detailing, which makes for a very easy build to put together. Now, normally on plastic model kits, generally you want to have as many parts to glue onto an object as possible in order for it to have nice crisp detailing. However, with the subject matter being a well bike, which is relatively simple in its detailing, as well as the scale, with the larger scale of 1.6, you can get away with having some more parts molded in, which otherwise on smaller scales would need to be separate castings. So digging in more thoroughly, first takes us to the wheels. You can see the spoke detailing present. Even has a little filler valve stem, which is a nice little bit of detailing to be found. Going deeper, takes us this runner here, which comprises the frame, as well as the engine. Here we have the piston head. You can see the detailing that is found on this part here. The fasteners are also nicely rendered and instead of being amorphous blobs they are indeed small little hex heads which is a nice little bit of feature. Some more detailing on the cooling fins here. And which this is more than likely that of the gas tank. Last runner, some more odds and ends. Obviously, this is the other portion of the engine. We have the seat and lots of other little gizmos, which undoubtedly are going to be important to assemble this model. But as small as they are, you can see that they are again are relatively simplistic in their overall shape and should again make for a very simple build. Keep in mind these pieces were originally intended to be mass produced for a completed model that was pre-built and painted and you want to have that replicated in the parts so that again it's easier for someone to mass produce on scale. Digging our way to the bottom of the box takes us to the tires. Now what's very nice is that the tires on this model here are not made from standard polystyrene and are actually made from the flexible Dragon styrene material. This material is seen on several of their 135th scale tanks, generally used for tarpaulins as well as tracks. Has some nice detailing on the thread surface. And it has some nice flexibility to it which should make it easy to put around the rims. On the bottom further takes us to the cog chain. Very nice choice of material by the way for Dragon to utilize the flexible DS material for this type of detailing. As trying to get this to fit around the sprocket and the engine it would probably be problematic if it was done in standard plastic. Also you can see the detailing found on this piece here which is very nicely rendered. Digging down deeper brings us to a piece of stiff wire. And last but not least are the instructions. Now generally this is the weakest portion of these Dragon kit builds. Specifically more so on their 1.6. On their 1.6 instructions. On their 135th scale instructions a lot of times they tend to have some mistakes in them. But generally 
are decent enough to put together. On their 1-6 scale counterparts, however, they basically phone it in as uh, what a popular YouTuber that I like to watch says, phone it in from orbit. So basically, one piece of paper, here we have the component listings, and there's the breakdown of the model. Shouldn't be too hard to put together. It does utilize CAD type drawings. And this kit here, I will say, the instructions are, believe it or not, more improved compared to some of their earlier renditions, namely their swim wagon, which literally just has a picture of the completed painted unit with a bunch of arrows pointing to it. So in that case, <laughs> these instructions here are definitely a leg up. But again, I'm gonna go through the build. If anything arises, I'll be sure to mention it later on in the video. Now normally on these videos I tend to start with the vehicle's lower suspension and move my way up from there. For this build however that's not going to be the case and that has to do with the way everything gets assembled. For this model here we're actually going to start with the engine because it's really the heart of the entire build. Now when it comes to the engine all the components that you see here are the stock units and were basically utilized out of the box. The parts are very large and clunky like you saw in the unboxing section, but because of that, that makes for a somewhat relatively easy assembly method. One thing, however, I need to point out is you are going to have a lot of seam work to contend with. This, of course, has to do with the two-part assembly of the majority of these pieces. Now, for the rear half of the engine, that's not necessarily a problem. Just some small seam work to contend with. It can be done relatively easily. Where the tricky part is, is with the piston head section that we have here. Because of these cooling fins, getting into each and every one of these recesses with a little bit of sandpaper is going to be tedious. It's not impossible or really hard necessarily, but it is something that you are going to take your time with. Now the reason why I said necessarily is that if you follow the instructions and go ahead and mount this directly to the frame before you go ahead and do any other sub-assemblies or take care of the seam work, then the complexity is going to skyrocket. It's best to do everything prior to the assembly of the frame. From the engine, this now brings us to the cog chain. Now, just like I showcased before in the unboxing, the cog chain on this model is comprised of a single piece of flexible DS styrene. This is the same material that Dragon likes to utilize on their 135th scale tank models for their Caterpillar tracks. Just like on those models, the chain itself is nicely detailed and has a nice flexibility to it. This piece here does paint very well and it's actually a fantastic choice of medium for the use of this component. However, I want to stress that on this model here, it is best to install this after the model is painted and weathered. In addition to fitting the chain after everything is painted and weathered, this also includes the component here for the clutch. Now, this piece is comprised of two little sections. We have this leg that comes out and the clutch mount. Now, on my build here, when I was actually building the vehicle, I went ahead and pre-fitted this to the engine prior to the installation of the entire bike. And of course, this was done before the paint and the weathering. However, when it came time to finish this model, when I went to put the chain on, I had a really difficult time in trying to get the chain around the small cog wheel that's found underneath this section here. So much so that what I went ahead and did was with a small screwdriver, I went ahead and pried the piece off, which it popped off cleanly from the glue joints. This then allowed me free access to fit the chain on, and then the clutch section was remounted over in a seamless affair. If I was doing this model again, this would be probably the very last bit of piece of equipment that would fit to this build. And it's definitely something for anyone who's building one of these well bikes to be aware of during their construction. From the chain, this now brings us to the exhaust and the exhaust manifold system. All these parts here are stock with the Dragon Kit and we're getting utilized basically out of the box. The only thing to mention on the exhaust pipe here in the back is that there is a slight molded seam found on these pieces, which again polish away very quickly and easily with some fine sandpaper. Where the work on the exhaust manifold was actually on this section over here. Now with the stock Dragon tooling, there is no bottom section and the piece is left completely hollow. Fortunately, it's hard for me to get the unit in on screen with my lighting situation. However, I'm going to flash pictures of what the stock piece looked like on the screen. Now, with the way the unit is designed, with these sections over here, 
you can actually see underneath into the cavity of the exhaust manifold, which does hurt the look of the part. Now, what I did was to fix this, I took two pieces of styrene blocks and I glued them to the front and to the back. What these do is they, these units completely fill in the visible area of the areas that were left hollow. Once the glues were dry, with some sandpaper, I polished everything down to match the curvature and the unit was completed and mounted in that format. From the exhaust manifold, this now brings us to the construction of the frame. Now, this is one aspect of the build that's actually very, very important because the alignment of all the parts need to be just right. Now, fortunately, the piece does assemble in a fairly quick and mostly effortless way. However, I must stress that the instructions are completely vague on this, and that's probably going to add more difficulty than anything else. However, if you were nice and patient and take your time and look at the instructions carefully, you should be able to figure out how everything goes. Basically, the engine mounts to one of the frame sides. There are a few bulkhead parts which get fitted to the frame, and once everything is set, that is when you can go ahead and install the secondary frame tubing. Now on some of these parts here, some of the mods to mention are that on this little bulkhead, there's actually a seam found on this because half of this unit is found on each of these stems. Obviously, a little bit of bodywork was all that was needed to polish that away. The other things to point out is that on some of the bulkheads, there were some injection pin marks which were found on the tooling. These can hurt the look of the piece and were quickly removed prior to the installation on the model with a little bit of bodywork. Not a whole lot, just a little bit of light putty work and some sanding was really all that was required to make the pieces nice and seamless to the way you see it here on this model. From the frame takes us to the rear tire assembly. Now this component over here does feature a few other sub-assemblies that get sandwiched together to form the detailing that you see here. Now, I must say that if you follow the instructions for the assembly of this piece, you're going to be thrown for a loop because the instructions are basically inaccurate on how this piece goes together. They want you to glue certain parts to this piece that really should not be glued on and are actually should be integrally fitted to the frame. If you have this kit, study the pieces before you add the glue and you'll see basically what I'm talking about. Starting with this hub, this component here is actually supposed to be mounted to the frame, as well as the sprocket section found on this side. The tire then just slides directly in place and then there is a block pin that holds everything in place. Now on that token, this now brings us to the rim and the tire. The Components on the model are nicely detailed in that we have some nice thread pattern found here on the tire. And the rim has some nice spoke detailing along with the little valve stem. If we can recall from the unboxing portion, the tire is made from the flexible DS styrene, while the rim itself is just made from your standard Dragon plastic. Now, although those two medias are really good choices for the assembly of this component, when it came time to the actual assembly, it was actually harder than I anticipated. With the way the rim is designed, there is a section that emerges from the rim itself and goes all the way around, and the rubber tire needs to envelop and slip over this piece in order for it to fit onto the rim like the way you see it here. Now, although the DS styrene is soft, it wasn't soft to the point where it made stretching on the part in a simple way and it did take some finagling and a little bit of manhandling in order to fully get it seated. Now perhaps if you soak the rubber tire in some warm tap water this should soften it up to the point where it makes the assembly a little bit effortless. However I gotta point out obviously you do not want to boil the part that would be a horrendous idea and you're gonna be out a set of tires which by the way these are unique to the well bike and it's not like something you could just find in a local hobby shop so you want to be careful with that again uh, some warm tap water possibly should be enough to soften them up for the assembly but like you see here I was able to get the pieces fitted properly without the use of the water and I just went in dry now if you're the type of individual that likes to mount the rubber tires after the rim is pre-painted that is not going to work for this build if with the type of 
flexing that I had to do on this piece, this really needs to be done prior to the thing being painted. Now, once the the tire was on the rim with some fine super glue, I added a little bead to this little joint here. And since the super glue was a really runny type, it went ahead and fully sealed around the section here, sucking the piece together and making the two units as one. This of course was done to both of the tires and to both sides. Once this was done, the tires were no longer going to cause any sort of an issue. Now again, while on the tires, I want to point out that this model does not have the ability for the tires to spin. In order to do this, this probably could be done, but you're going to need to add some kind of a washer system to these sections on the fork and also on the rear. If you build it out of the box like I did, the sections over here on the fork will actually pinch onto the tire and if you try to rotate it you're actually going to scratch the paint. On the model over here since it's just a static model I went ahead and added a little drop of super glue to the securing bolt locking the wheels in place and preventing them from moving. On the rear section here in addition to the washers you're probably going to also want to modify and change the shape of the frame which holds up the rear fender because again just like on the front the rear fender actually grasps onto the rubber tire and it really holds in place and prevents it from spinning. If you try to spin it, again, the only thing you can achieve is having some scratch paint on the two sections here of the tire. Now, while on the topic of the fender, the fender that you see here is stock with the kit, but some mods that I made were, again, deletion of some injection pin marks that are on the underneath. This was done with a little bit of putty and just a couple swipes with some sandpaper. Now from the fender, this brings us to the seat. The seat itself is comprised of four components. We have the seat mount stem, the stem itself, the seat pan, and the actual seat. Now the mount gets fitted to these two bulkheads, which do have a small hole in them, which are integrally molded in. However, I found that on this model here, I have to do some slight hand fitting in order to get the part to fit in in a nice, smooth manner. Once the piece gets fitted, however, you're all done. Now for the seat itself, if I could go ahead and adjust this unit in my hand. This now brings us to the pan. Now the pan is nicely detailed, however, there are some injection pin marks to delete. This is easily done with a little bit of putty and some sandpaper. Now, if one little detail that's nice about the Dragon Kit is that Dragon went ahead and molded in both the framework as well as the little springs for the underside of the seat. Now, to really make the model pop, I went ahead and painted those individually with a small paintbrush. Now, of course, this cannot be done once the seat is mounted to the pan. You're not going to be able to get in here with a paintbrush due to these small tight confines. Even with the thinnest paintbrush you could find, it's just not going to be feasible. The best way to assemble this part is you need to install this after everything is already painted. This is ideally best done at the tail end of the build. Once everything is all painted and weathered, you just simply mount the seat to the pan the way you see it on this build. Now once the unit is fully assembled, it just slides directly into the mount that we have here. Now the seat is actually fully adjustable for two reasons. First, to adjust for the height of the rider, but the real reason has to do with the collapsible feature found on the well bike. Now on that, that brings us to that feature of the kit. The kit is designed to be displayed in either the collapsed or the deployed mode. Now a few people are going to wonder, can you have this model transform and change on you the, on the fly? And the answer is technically it can, but realistically it's best not to do that. The reason why I say that is for the unit to collapse, this piece here is actually hinged in this small little mount and the entire fork assembly needs to be shifted downward and then the unit can then pivot down. Now the problem is the plastic used on these pieces is can be considered frail and it's not really meant for long-term constant use. There's no pins or any type of pieces found on the stock kit so doing this is going to wear out the plastic components very quickly. This type of setup is found on several other driving kits, namely 135th scale, where it looks like you can make something fully function, but in actuality, once the rubber hits the road, it's really not meant for that. 
In addition to that section over here, the handlebars can also fold up, but again, the material found on this yoke section is very, very frail and can't break very easily. Another reason that the unit is best not to be made collapsible has to do with the tolerances found on these parts here. Tolerances are actually very, very tight, which is good in one aspect. However, when it comes time to making the piece functional, the paint is going to scratch off when you start manipulating these parts and it's just going to lead to a lot of problems very quickly. So if anyone's interested in buying one of these well bikes, you have to ask yourself, which way do you want to display the model? Do you want to display it fully deployed so you can have your figure with it? Or do you want to display it in the collapse state? That is the best way to approach this build. Honestly, if you have the ability, I would recommend buying two of these units. The first, again, build like the way you see it here, and the other one for the other display mode. Now from the fork and the collapsing feature, this brings us to the fuel tanks. Now the fuel tanks are just like with the exhaust manifold where the backside sections are completely hollow and cavernous. Now, unlike the manifold where it's only in certain angles where you'll see it, on the gas tanks, in my opinion, are more noticeable because they are probably the biggest substantial piece found on this model. And because of their locations, you do get some pretty good viewing of the rear sides. Now, flashing on screen, you'll see pictures of the stock units as well as how I fix them. The way I took care of this issue was that with some sheet styrene, I cut it to the shape of the inside portion of the rear side, and I built up these two sections. With a little bit of bodywork, this deleted the seams, making the gas tank detailing completely seamless. Now, if you notice on the front corners of those pictures, there's a hole that remains, and it doesn't really match each other, but this was done on purpose because on the model here, there is a section where the gas tank needs to plug into, and once the units attach, that section is no longer visible. In fact, those cutouts are absolutely mandatory because the fuel tanks need to fit to the frame in a very specific way, and I believe I actually had to remove a little bit of material in order for the pieces to fit on fully. So it's another little bit of detailing that you need to hand fit prior to the assembly. However, once this is done, in my opinion, it greatly helps improve the model compared to leaving the pieces with their cavernous tooling. Now, from the fuel tanks, this brings us to the control cables and the brake lines. The only bit of equipment that I just mentioned that is actually supplied with the kit is this rear brake line that we have here, which is made from a nice little piece of wire and is pre-bent and pre-shaped out of the box. It simply goes into its appropriate locations and the piece is good to go. I did modify this little section here by drilling out the small little holes which were pre-molded in with a small little pin vise. I believe that the wire actually fit in a lot better once the holes were added for obvious reasons as the piece was left basically solid. Now for the remainder of the cabling, this was all added by myself and it's not included with the model. However, once added, it really makes the model pop. Now to aid me in the cabling detailing as well as the rest of the detailing in general on this model, I actually based it off of a real British wall bike that I had the opportunity to see in person. It was at the last military vehicle show. I actually ran into it basically by chance, ironically on my way out. And while there, I was able to take some thorough high-res photographs of this actual unit. These pictures are posted on the EastCoastArmory.com Facebook page on the link listed below in the video description. These pictures really were instrumental in the model that you see here. Now, starting with the fuel system, the Dragon Kit is actually pretty thorough in this regard. The carburetor detailing and the fuel line detailing on this location are pretty good and were basically built out of the box. The only thing I did was I painted the fittings with their brass coloring, but I'll go over that a little bit later. What was added, however, was if I turn the bike to this side, you can see the rubber hose, which emerges from this section of the fuel tank, runs along the bottom 
and then connects to this section here of the gas tank on the opposite side. This detailing was taken directly off of the real unit I photographed. The next wiring includes the spark plug and the spark plug wire. The spark plug detailing again is found on the kit and was molded in in a nice way, but there is no wiring connected to this piece. On the real well bike, the wire actually emerges from this rear section here of what I believe is the flywheel and then would be bolted directly to the end section here of the spark plug. Now the two remaining cables to mention is the clutch and the throttle. The handlebar on the left hand side with the little lever here, this one is the clutch. This cable emerges from this unit, travels down the fork along the frame, and then underneath the engine that we have here. It then re-emerges on this side where it connects directly to the clutch system that I mentioned before. Oddly enough, Dragon goes ahead and molds in a small little hole in this little section here for the cabling and with a small pin vise I just drilled it out thoroughly in order for the wire to get a better grasp onto the piece. Of course the Two sections here were also drilled out with a pin vise in order for the wires to slip in. Now for the throttle, this is a little bit more straightforward. The throttle emerges from this section here of the handlebar and just runs directly to the carburetor that we have right over here. Now from there, this brings us to the paint and the weathering. For the models I'll drab, I went with a shade which is very different compared to the other shades which have been used on other builds of mine in the past. Now for the weathering, this is where things get interesting and this is really where it paid to see the real unit in person. Many of the parts on the British Well Bike are actually made from brass and you'll see that with some of the dry brushing. First and foremost on this cover over here, you'll notice that the brass is starting to show out from the edge. This is directly taken off of the real unit. If you're dry brushing or weathering this unit and you want to have steel showing through, you're going to have a mistake. This is also true for a lot of the fittings found here on the carburetor. Now for the fuel lines, of course, the they are brass on the real unit and you'll notice that I went ahead and weathered them with a little bit of gloss black airbrushing just to have that grimy look to them. This is also true for the other fasteners and filler, filler spouts found on the gas tank. Specifically on this end here where this is actually I believe the fillet spout on how you fill these things up. A little swipe of brass was also added to the bottom portion here of the fuel line that I mentioned before again to simulate the brass fittings. For the spark plug you also want to paint that to represent the ceramic and it's another way to help make your model pop. Now for the seat, this is again patterned off of the real ones that I've seen. I'm not sure, but I believe there may also be brown versions of the leather, but this is something that really would be best left to do some research on. On the seat itself, you'll notice that I went ahead and painted the rivets in aluminum or silver coloring. Again, all the detailing that you see here, I'm basing off of a real well bike. Same thing is also true for the little clutch handle. This is also made from brass on the real unit, so the brass dry brushing was added to this part as well. Another quick tip to recommend is to paint the little valve stem with a drop of black paint. This also helps push the model a little bit further from just leaving everything with overspray of the base. And here's the well bike with a figure now placed on it. Now the figure is a 1-6 scale Dragon action figure and from what I've seen it is definitely in scale with the figure and I can attest to their sheer small stature and size. And in case anyone was wondering, yes that is a British tanker and no it's not necessarily appropriate to have a British tanker on a British airborne well bike but considering that I don't really have a whole lot of British figures in my collection, this was the closest thing I could make do with. And it's still more appropriate compared to having an American GI or a Russian or possibly even a German figure posing with it. Although I guess for Arnhem that might make sense. 
Moving along to steel level and recommendation, the Weld Bite Kit is a very simple and rudimentary plastic kit, because of which a beginner can tackle one of these builds. However, one caveat to keep aware of is the instruction sheets. The instructions are very, very, very ambiguous and are really, really vague. So you are going to have to do a lot of detective work in order to piece the kit together. Luckily, the Weld Bike itself is a fairly simplistic type model, so it shouldn't take too long in order to find out where the parts need to go. Although this model here is acceptable for a beginner to build, in my opinion, an medium and advanced range builder can really take the base starter kit and kick it up to the next level. You can polish it up and add extra detailing to it, which will really elevate it from the stock kit offering. Now, for recommendations, obviously with the subject matter, anyone who is a fan and a collector of the 1-6 scale dragon action figures, or just 1-6 scale military action figures in general, would appreciate this kit. Anyone who's also a fan of World War II military vehicles would appreciate this kit as well. In addition to anyone who is a fan of the British World War II paratrooper regiments, this kit here would also check a lot of boxes for you. Another individual who might not necessarily even stumble into this kit, but would be one that would appreciate it, would be an individual who likes to build 1-6 scale motorcycle kits. Now, although 1-6 scale is a relatively new military modeling scale, for the longest time, 1-6 scale has been an accepted and appreciated scale for miniature scale motorcycles. Several companies make several renditions in this scale, and this wall bike here would be a very unique addition to your collection if you're one of those type of individuals. Another obvious individual who would appreciate this kit would be anyone who is a fan of 1-6 scale military dioramas. If you're one of those individuals that like doing vignettes or large scale outdoor dioramas, well, one of these things propped up against a wall or something would definitely be appreciated. Also, one of these kits would be really cool to model in the collapse mode with the storage container tube, again, to support some kind of a British paratrooper type figure. Now, availability is going to be a bit of a hurdle when it comes time to tracking down one of these kits. These models are no longer in production, and they haven't been for some time now, because of which you're not going to be able to find them as easily as some other kits that are on the market. Something like this is not going to be the type of kit that you'll be able to find in your local hobby shop unless it's tucked away in some corner in the back lot somewhere. A model like this, you're generally going to be able to find on eBay or at a place like a, a model show. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 1-6 scale British well bike. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content like model showcase videos that we have here or the 1-6 scale project update videos that frequently get posted. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are showcased on the ECA channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.